hello. I think uh, while we wait for uh, more people to come in, I'll uh, introduce myself. My name is uh, Stefano Mazzini. Um, I work for Balsamic, which is a distributed company. So that means we work from home. Most of us work from home. And um, that means we can get to choose where we want to live. And so since I'm Italian, uh, and I'm living here in the Netherlands, the question that I get asked the most is, why did you move from Italy to the Netherlands? And the answer is, because I like it. I think it's a really cool uh, country. In fact, look at what kind of venues we have, what kind of event conferences we have here. It's awesome. So, welcome. I hope you enjoyed your uh, lunch. And um, today I'm gonna talk about the experience that I've made um, in Balsamic uh, putting GraphQL in production. And let me tell you right away that it's been an awesome experience. So how many of you have heard about GraphQL? And how many of you have used it in production? All right, so there's plenty to learn. And I um, um, definitely suggest you to uh, take a look at it. It's a really cool technology. So let me tell you a little bit about GraphQL. Oh, by the way, the title used to be, in the schedule, used to be a Relay in production. But I, th I figured I should have changed it because it's more low level. And besides, it's not even that, uh, you know, we'll see. So it's, it's a bunch of stuff that I learned. And hopefully, it's, it's useful to you and, uh, and you like it. So GraphQL, very quick introduction, is an alternative to REST. So uh, it's a way to get data from the server to the client, just different than REST. It's uh, uh, space efficient on the network because basically each request describes exactly what the client needs from the server. And so instead of uh, hitting an entry point that was designed like years ago with uh, different clients in mind that carries all sort of information, you can specify exactly what you want and that's what you're gonna get, nothing more. Um, it turns out also to be a very nice way to, uh, to describe the data requirements on the UI. So if you use React, but also if you don't use React, uh, you can still find very nice ways to, uh, to have a really close binding between the UI components and the data that they require from the server. And that's something that I really like because normally there's a lot of indirection in the code. Uh, between what you see and how you get it from the server. So it's, it's nice. Um, it also turns out, in my opinion, that it's a nice way to organize the code in the server um, because of the way you have to implement a GraphQL server. That's called a schema. Um, so uh, GraphQL is, let's, you know, let's see how it looks like. So this is a request. This is what it looks like. Uh, with, you know, if you compare it to REST, in REST you have an entry point that is pretty much opaque. You just hit an entry point and then you have to know what you get. In GraphQL, instead, you describe what you get. And you can think of this as a JSON, only the keys of the JSON without the values. And then, guess what? The, re the response is uh, the JSON with the values. So that's the kind of uh, simplification that you sh should think about when you think about running GraphQL. And um, the GraphQL is made of uh, basically three parts. One is you know, how to read data from the server. There's another thing that's called a mutation, that is how you write data to the server, how you change the server-side state. And then uh, there's a new addition, a la the latest addition, that's uh, subscription, the concept of subscriptions. And that's the way how the server can notify to the client what, in, what information has changed. And the client can you know, have a... Have a, have a have a voice in the, in, the, in, the, in the process to tell what needs to be notified. So just to be clear, GraphQL is just a transport layer. Um, and you're still left with the problem of this, you know, dealing with the management of the, the application state in your UI. And for doing that, there's many um, libraries out there like Relay or Apollo. Um, Relay is the one uh, Facebook came up with. Apollo is a community-driven effort. Um, and now Relay just announced a new version that's called Relay Modern. And so they have Relay Modern and Relay Classic. Uh, it's really 1.0 and 2.0 in my opinion, but that's how they call it. And with this stuff, you can define how your component can uh, specify data requirements. Um, 
and the library helps, uh, uh, helps you deal with the communication issues, like how do you get the data from the server to your components, and then takes care of caching, so all of that stuff. Um, so it's, it's uh, interesting, but they're big uh, in a way, so um, you, know, you, you, you can choose. Um, so as I said, a work for Balsamic, and it's a product you may be familiar with or not, uh, if you are, this is what it looks like. It's uh, an application, desktop application, typically, uh, that you can use for creating uh, low-fidelity wireframes um, of applications, websites, uh, you know, apps, uh, you name it. Um, you may know, if you use it, that we already have an online version of it that's called MyBalsamic uh, you, that you can use through your browser. Uh, and we have been in the process of rewriting the whole thing to JavaScript. Um, so, um, a couple of colleagues from, my, uh, from me also gave other talks, interesting uh, talks about how we rewrote the whole application. So, what I'm going to talk about today is um, uh, the experience I made in uh, writing the new version, the new online version, which is called Balsamic Cloud, and this is what it looks like. It's a screenshot from the application. It's in production, but it's still in private beta, so we're still refining a few rough edges. Um, it's basically a container for projects. Uh, and then when you click on the project, you can actually edit, edit the project uh, in your browser. Uh, but it's a container, so you have multiple projects. And of course, you can collaborate on it. So you have multiple people um, in your site. And then you have a site. So you, you got to have settings for that site, where you can change the owners of the site, the name of the site, this kind of stuff. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting little application. Um, it's little, but really not that little. Uh, if you think about it, let's give, let's give a few numbers. So uh, 26,000 lines of code for the part that I was responsible for, uh, that I am responsible for, and, and the, um, the actual editor uh, is 130K in, in comparison. So it's an interesting size, not too, not too big, not too small. Um, we have 30 external dependencies that we really care about, like we chose a library because we needed a, a solution for a specific problem. 30, about 30 of those that, in the end, uh, you know, end up being 115 dependencies in package.json because Webpack and, uh, you know, everything you need to support your stack of development, you know how it works. And then the whole thing explodes to 860 modules in not modules directory because that's the world we live in. Uh, but we all know it. It's fine. Uh, we have about 200 React components that are spread in 50 files around. Um, 32 GraphQL mutations, so 32 different ways you can write the data to the server, 25 different ways that the server can notify uh, that something has changed, and we have about 80% coverage in, in server-side code with integration tests. Um, so the architecture, let me tell you a little bit about the architecture. So everything runs on Amazon uh, services, which uh, is a mess, as we all know. Like, there's tons of... Uh, services, and Convox is a little tool that we found that is really interesting because it tries to make a sense of all these services without you having to uh, go crazy. Um, you still have to know what AWS services are and mean, but Convox is, is, is interesting, so look it up if you have a chance. Um, so the most interesting uh, part, of course, is the GraphQL entry point, and that's how you get GraphQL queries. That one works on top of what's called a schema. So in order to implement a GraphQL server, you have to define a schema. Um, and that's basically um, a bunch of type definitions. Uh, it's how the server knows what information uh, the client can fetch. Um, that one uh, then works on top of the database, of course, and through a Redis cache. So when you hit the database, when you hit, uh, we make a big use of Redis cache, and so if it's hot, then uh, we don't expect many reads to hit the, actually hit the database. Um, and then mutations are the other part of the schema, which is you know, how you write data. We like to keep um, those separate, in separate files, because we like to uh, have a clean separation in the code base uh, between the part of the code that is read-only and the part of the code that actually performs writes, has side effects. Um, and furthermore, we like to separate the mutation definitions, uh, which are the, um, the type definition, as I said, from the actual implementation. Just look, you know, think about old C language, where you had the .h and the .c file for a type definition, and then uh, the implementation. 
Same here, we like to have separate files for defining the types and then the implementation. So the implementation, that's what we call operations. Um, and then we have other HTTP entry points because, for example, logging into the application, performing authentication, that, that, that can't be done through a GraphQL. And so those also may hit operations or uh, the database if they need to. And then, of course, the real interesting stuff happens in the operations. That's where you know, send out emails, uh, you know, deal with the database, change things, and then maybe payment process or notifications, this kind of stuff. So um, everything is implemented according to um, uh, a pattern that's called hexagonal architecture. If you're not familiar with it, I suggest you take a look at it because it's an interesting uh, um, pattern. Uh, maybe something you already do, but you don't know it's called like, like that. So uh, the idea, uh, my personal rule of thumb is that basically if you have an external dependency, an external library, um, you never import it in your code base uh, other than one single file, one single module. And in that module, what you do is implement a really simple and thin wrapper around the API of that library. And you use that wrapper in your code instead of uh, the actual library. So that's called an adapter. And in, at the beginning, it's like uh, kind of frustrating because you're really creating these little stupid functions that map one to one, maybe the functions in the external library. But it turns out to be really helpful, especially in JavaScript land, because you know that the library you choose today is going to be you know, different or dead or upgraded in two months from now. And, uh, this, this solution also you know, has helped us in already, even before going to production, because uh, stuff was changing while we were developing. And so it's nice to, to know that you have only one file in your code base that uses that module. And that's the only place you have to change if that module changes. So that's good. And we have wrappers for adapters for everything uh, in cloud. Basically, authentication, caching, uh, database, logging, you name it, we wrapped it. And the way you um, make these uh, services available through the code base is, of course, by dependence injection. So you see uh, relatively few import statements in our code, but a lot of uh, um, objects being adapters being passed inside the module function, uh, inside functions. And those are all made available through the GraphQL context. So that's how uh, we get them. So basically, the problem we're trying to solve is this one, right? So this is a quote that, from Joe Armstrong that I really like it. So if you wanted, you, wanted, you wanted a banana, but what you got was a gorilla holding the banana and the entire jungle. So that's a problem we're trying to solve with this, uh, with this pattern. Um, so this is a little bit of code. Um, they told me that I should have shown code, so here it is. Uh, you don't have to understand it all. It's a, it's, a, it's a bunch of code. And besides, it's also very similar to the code you find uh, in the documentation if you look, for example, Relay. Um, this is just the way um, you define a type, like project, uh, with the fields that you can uh, query on that type. The only thing you want to uh, notice here is that the resolve function, which is the actual function that does fetch that information, is not, is not defined here because, as I said, we like to keep it in a separate place. And so you see that resolve with logger is just a utility function that we wrote to, uh, to, simply, to you know, catch errors and notify them better than uh, the library itself would do otherwise. Um, but then it's simply relaying uh, the call to a different function in a different module. So um, this instead is what a mutation looks like. And this is a bit different than what you see in the documentations of Relay um, because uh, we built this uh, little helper also. Um, and that's leveraging the only uh, naming convention we have in our code base because, as I said, we like to keep the mutations and the operations separate in two separate files. So the operation would be the actual implementation and the mutation would be just a type definition. So because they have the same name and they just live in different directories, we created that little uh, helper to, uh, to write a little bit less, of, less code. Because if there's one problem, uh, let's say, in, uh, in this uh, relay land, is that it, it, it can be a little verbose. It feels a little verbose. You have to write a lot of stuff. So maybe this is the only thing we try to, uh, to simplify our life a little bit. Um, this is what an operation looks like, the actual implementation, right? How you fetch a uh, specific kind of information. And uh, there's a bunch of stuff here as well. You don't have to understand this. Maybe just you know, notice how uh, we have a bunch of adapters and we pass them all in as, the fu in, as function parameters. So uh, this is how we implemented dependence injection. So uh, 
and, and, then, uh, and then this is how you use it. So, you know, calling uh, the, the, the database, there's a method called the change site name. So you will not see actual SQL in this function because we collected all the SQL in, in a separate part of the code base. Uh, it's, you know, again, it's about encapsulation and it's nice to have everything that's database, specific database, low-level database in one place and then you just use different places, you just use different code. Um, and so, and this is instead just a couple of uh, sanity checks. And this is another thing that I learned uh, while writing this code uh, about um, how to deal with error management. So in case of an error condition, what I find very useful, what I find useful is that instead of throwing just an error, I throw um, a specific uh, uh, kind of error that carries three information, three types of information. One is a simple text for the user. So a very simple text that doesn't have any technical information in it, uh, no IDs, no technical names, just a, a very simple indication to the user of what should happen uh, next for him. So it could even be just, you know, write email to customer support, you know, if it's serious enough. So something for the user. Then the next step is something for us, something that goes only in the internal logs that we can see, and that has to be technical. So as many IDs you want to put in uh, just to figure out, you know, how to reproduce the issue from the server logs. Um, and then finally, uh, a code. Now, this is a string, but in retrospect, I wish I, I had used the numbers because it's even more opaque. And this code goes together with the first part, with the simple text for the user. So this is what's being spit in the face of the user, a simple text and a code. Because when they, report, when they write to us in support, maybe they'll just copy and paste what they see on the screen or they send us a screenshot. And it's nice for us to see that number, that code, because that identifies exactly in the code base where the exception was thrown. And we make sure that these codes are unique across all the code base. So that's also a really interesting uh, um, thing uh, that I found really useful. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about uh, is reactivity. So Re React, reactivity, reactive are all buzzwords today, and they mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. The meaning I'm talking about is that when you have um, a site that presents some information and you, on a different browser tab or somebody else, changes part of that information, you, wanna, you, wanna, you want your page to update in real time, sort of near to real time. So this is what I mean. So in, the case, in our case, for example, I have a little user avatar up there. So if I have two browser tabs and I change my user avatar on one of them, I'm expecting the other one to show an updated avatar as soon as I click Save over here. So that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. So in order to do that, of course, we need you know, some sort of uh, um, communication like a web, uh, web socket to the server so that the server can push events to the client. So that's, of course, we need that. But how, how do you decide the granularity of the events, uh, what kind of events you send in that channel? So that's the stuff that I, I, uh, I had a lot to learn while doing it. So let's go over a couple of examples. So this is a naive example of how to solve that problem that uh, you know, yields to overfetching. So it's, it's not a good solution, but it's easy to follow. So let's say, for example, that the client sends a mutation. It's called change user avatar, right? So I have on this browser tab a change user avatar mutation. And then I have the server that changes you know, the database. And then it says, well, now I have to notify the clients. And so I'll just send an event. And there's a channel that's called application, for example. And so on the client, uh, I have every component of my UI, every React component, if I use React, uh, that listens to, uh, to events. And so when it receives an event, uh, they will force fetch, meaning that's you know, the, the relay way to uh, refetch from the server the information uh, that, that the component is displaying. So this is clearly solving the problem because as soon as uh, I, I, I change the user avatar, every component in the page will reload everything. So it's clearly inefficient, but it does the job, right? So how can I improve on this? Uh, well, for example, I can have specific events. So when I send a mutation, change user avatar, uh, the server can just not fire a generic event, but it can fire a specific event that's called user avatar changed. And so my UI components can actually filter on the uh, event name, and so they will only force fetch when, so the, 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 the user avatar component will only force fetch when it receives a user avatar changed um, event. 
So that improves things, but still I have a lot of components listening to a lot of events that it just discard. So uh, another way to improve things is to have narrower channels. So instead of having a generic application channel, I can have, for example, a specific user channel. So each user in the application can, have, can be associated with a specific channel, and I can use, for example, the user ID to, uh, to uh, distinguish between the channels. And so the server, when changing the avatar of user X, will just you know, fire an event on the user X channel. And then, of course, this is uh, improving things. Um, but this quickly becomes complicated uh, if you go you know, in, in, and see what this really means in a real application. Because, for example, let's take a look at this page. So here I have, this is the site settings page. And here I can decide who owns this site. And I can choose two owners. So those owners are obviously users. And so I can specify two users. Now, what happens if I, uh, one of those users on their browsers uh, decides to change their name because there was a typo, and so they changed the name? So I'm expecting these two combo boxes to you know, update, showing the correct you know, the updated name. So let's keep that example in mind, and then let's just simplify the, the, the screen a little bit. This, you know, this is a simplification of uh, the same screen as we were looking at right now. So we have a user avatar there, and then some content, and then those two combo boxes, right, with the two users. So the example we just made, a simple one of changing the user avatar, would work like this. So that component up there, the user avatar, would listen to the channel user, you know, specific user uh, showing. And so on the back end, when I receive a change user avatar uh, um, uh, mutation, then I would just fire an event on the channel of that user. And, and we said that this is going to work, right? This is fine. Now, the complicated case is this one, right? So I have those two combo boxes, and each one of them is listening to the channel of the user that is currently selected. So in that case, uh, when I receive on the server side a change user name uh, mutation, then again, I just need to fire an event on that uh, user channel. But now, if you think about it from the UI point of view, this is complicated because it means that in the combo box, if I switch the user, the selected user, then I have to stop listening to the channel of that user and start listening to the channel of the other user that I just selected. So this is really complicated from a UI point of view. And I wouldn't like to code my UI having, keeping that in mind. So it's, it's, not very, it's not very simple. And so one way that you can improve this is maybe you know you can come up with an idea of having a, a site channel. This this page is you know re related to a site. We have a concept of site, so maybe I can have a channel for the whole site, and maybe I can decide that the server sends over events for anything that's relevant to the site. So at least I don't I don't have to do this trick with the uh, combo boxes, right? So in this case, what's going to happen if I change the username of one of those two um, users? is that the server needs to send a message on the channel of the user that I'm changing. But then, if that user happens to be an owner of another site, I have to send a message on that site as well. So I do send a message to the user channel, but I also have to send a message to the site channel that the user is an owner of. So if, if, you, if you look at it, if you see it, it, we're just moving the complexity from the UI to the server. Now, this complexity is not going, is not going away. It's, it's an inherent part of your application, and you have to deal with it in a way or another. My point is that maybe it's better to deal with this sort of stuff on the server rather than the client, but you know, it's, it's, it's hard to tell. But it's, it's definitely a kind of complexity that is there, and uh, it's not going away. So um, when, you, when we recap about this reactivity um, topic, we see that basically Relay Classic, um, which is the Relay version one that's out there uh, now, right now, have, offers no solution um, at all out of the box. So you have to go to implement your own, uh, your own uh, publish subscribe mechanism like WebSockets or PubNub or whatever, plus force fetch, which is what we did because when we started there was only Relay uh, Classic. So it is a solution, it, it, is in, it, is, it is a bit inefficient. And so we had to do a few optimization, like a kind of hacky optimizations to, uh, to, to deal with that. Um, Relay Modern and Apollo uh, do offer a better solution, which is uh, GraphQL subscriptions. And those are an improvement over 
um, force fetch because you can tell the server exactly what information you want to get. And so you're saving a few round trips and uh, maybe a little bit of bandwidth as well. But uh, don't think that this kind of complexity is going away magically. There's a framework that, that you know, takes care of this for you because it inherently uh, uh, depends on your application. So live queries is another stuff that is not a topic that people have been talking about. It's promising, but still an open discussion. We don't know what's going to happen with that. So as I said, this is an inherent complexity. You have to deal with it in a way or another. Um, then uh, a couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, it's a uh, data loader is, is uh, if you're, you know, if, if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, GraphQL, definitely take a look at data loader. It's a, you know, simple name. People think that it's just a concept. It's a library. It's a library on GitHub. Look at it. It's, it's really interesting. And it's basically a way to uh, have an implementation that goes from uh, order of n complexity to order of log n. It's, pre it's pretty good. Um, it's simple enough to use, but um, check it out. And then uh, caching, of course. Uh, I think if you do re uh, GraphQL, you have somehow to do a lot of caching as well, because otherwise you risk being more inefficient than just, using a, just doing a, a plain uh, um, REST API. So we use Redis. And um, yeah, there's a bunch of things um, uh, bound to caching. So I don't, I don't really want to talk about this. Uh, but it's, it, you, know, it, you know, caching is, is a hard topic in computer science, right? So um, yeah, it's something, keep in mind, it, it's something that as early you do it, the better it is, um, especially with GraphQL. Uh, the last topic is testing. Um, so we. Uh, we are really happy with uh, uh, the kind of testing we've done so far. And the way that our tests look like, uh, uh, really simple. So we have a test that starts that generates database, a real database, a real MySQL database on the fly from scratch, sets up all the fixture. And then uh, um, the, the test runner fires an actual uh, GraphQL request to the server. So we have two processes. Um, no, not two processes, but you know, two things coming up. And then the server serves the request, and then we check the results are the expected ones. Maybe we check a couple of mocked um, uh, environments, and then we do a cleanup. And then we go to the next test. You would think this is slow, but um, actually, because of the, uh, because of the um, hexagonal architecture that I told you, we can mock as many adapters as we want. And of course, we don't want to test like uh, sending out emails. We don't care about that. We, don't, we can trust that system to work. Uh, we don't want to send actual notifications. So we, we, you, you can mock a lot of stuff. So the only thing we, we didn't mock is the Redis cache and the database. That's, that's a real one. And doing this way, we have 200 milliseconds per test only including regenerating the whole database. So we can run 120 tests in less than 30 seconds. To me, that's pretty good. Um, so we're really happy about that. Um, and I think uh, GraphQL lends itself very good, very, very good to, to testing, because you can specify the queries, the information you want, and then uh, the server is going to provide that information. Um, it's nice to write tests this way. Uh, you can change the UI. So one, one problem with the testing, for example, is brittleness. So you change your uh, REST API entry point because you need to, because your, your UI has changed, and all of a sudden your test break. Um, but with GraphQL, and not, it's not, that's not the case, because every request uh, carries its own information about what data should be fetched. And so the tests uh, keep running, because they keep asking uh, the same data over and over. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's been a good experience. So um, wrapping up, um, we were really lucky uh, with this project because it was sort of a greenfield uh, uh, project. When we uh, decided to write a new application that was not supposed to be a rewrite of uh, the older application, but just a very, uh, really a new application, then we were starting Greenfield, basically. And so it was nice, because I could go out and say, oh, let's see what's available out there. And then I found uh, Relay, I found GraphQL, and I find all sort of cool technology. And so, yay, that's happiness for a hacker, right? Um, but then uh, you find, yeah, 
all these uh, frameworks out there, all of these libraries that uh, tell you that you know you're going to be more productive with those frameworks, uh, and then um, and they leverage uh, interesting uh, technologies and, and methodologies like uh, naming conventions, uh, so that you don't have to write a lot of configuration um, default behaviors, uh, because then you can you know be up and running in no time, just a couple of scripts. Uh, automatic stuff, like uh, caching automatically, uh, you know, all the sort of things that an ORM, uh, you know, you can find a lot of stuff that looks very advanced and very cool, um, but to me, this uh, belongs to the realm of magic. Uh, it's, it's the, the more clever the solution it is, then the more magic it is, and I, don't, I personally don't like magic uh, in my code because I tend to forget uh, very quickly and when I go back to my own code in six months, I will have totally forgotten the kind of magic that I had used six months before. And I invariably look at the code and look, ah, what, what does this mean? Like, why do I have a method name that looks like this? And I don't find it anywhere in the code base if I search uh, for that method name, because maybe it was just magically created by some uh, introspection mechanism. That kind of stuff is tricky, and I don't like it. And I value much more um, code that is unsurprising and predictable. Because then, when I go back to it, I understand, and everyone else can understand if they join the team. So I welcome, in this regard, I welcome boilerplate if I have to, because it will be down, easier down the line. And uh, explicit configurations, I, I'm happy to write as much configuration as needed, as long as you know, it's clear and explicit. Um, ad hoc caching. Caching is a hard beast to tame. And uh, I think that you know, magic solutions for caching are only solving part of the problem. You will only, you know, eventually you will have to bite the bullet and you implement caching in a specific way for your application. Um, plain SQL. So today, you know, we've, been, we've seen thousands of ORM solutions uh, and yeah, you know, SQL still is the best way to write and optimize uh, access to a database. So welcome SQL. Um, these are all techno techniques that can be, you know, uh, can be described as uninteresting and repetitive because everyone knows them, right? So they're boring. But this is safe. This is stuff that you know can stand the passage of time, right? So this is what I prefer over magic uh, uh, any time. So um, my conclusion would be that you have to play cool, you know, but also safe, you know. So uh, find something that is nice to use, but uh, apply sound. Uh, our, you know, engineering, software engineering practices to it because uh, it makes sense. And um, I'm reminded that uh, you should give feedback. So download the application of the of the uh, of the conference and please uh, give us feedback. Um, thank you. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. And uh, oh, by the way, uh, this is really fun. So I was reading about it and it says, do not throw at anyone's head. So <laughs> I think I'm pretty sure that if I <laughs> throw to someone now, I'll hit the head. So does anyone have questions? You sure you don't want to get this one on the head? It's pretty fun. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm really happy to, uh, to talk about GraphQL and, uh, and this kind of stuff. All, you know, whenever you want, I'm over here uh, ready to hang out. All right, no question. Thanks.